Hello folks, welcome back to the channel, thank you very much for joining me once again. You are always most welcome. Well, as you heard, <clears throat> I've regenerated like a Time Lord. I've even got a shirt like a Time Lord on today. I'm back, cleaner, younger, crisper than ever. And Christmas is almost upon us. It is the season to be jolly. So, back by popular demand, I'm going to enjoy today a little drinky booze. Because people keep saying, oh, you don't drink the wine anymore, it's, it's not quite the same. And Yes, I think, I think there's a balance to be struck with these things, isn't there? But as Christmas is almost upon us, my good lady wife said I can have a nice drink today. And it is, without further ado, it is the McGuigan's uh, Black Label Shiraz from good old Australia. In fact, I should have had the Australian flag out for the wine, I forgot. Anyway, cheers to all of you. Um, perhaps a bit early for Christmas, but we're almost there, aren't we? I've even got my Christmas lights out, as you can probably see, flickering away in the background. Mm. Anyway, it's good to be back. Um, the new, younger version of the Time Lord, model Time Lord, is here. So, as you already know, we have today the Ming F4G Phantom II, the Wild Weasel. Now, I've not seen this kit before, um, but of course I did recently, quite recently, do the uh, review on the Zokimura, the D version of the Phantom. So, a good friend of the channel, David, said, why don't you do this one? I've, I've just picked it up at a very good price. I won't quote the exact price he picked it up for, but it was low. And, you know, this, we just had Black Friday, of course, end of November. There's a lot of deals around on things like this. This came out tail end of last year, start of this year. <coughs> And uh, so it's 2022 dated kit, of course. Um, but it's just uh, available now for some really crazy prices. I mean, you know, an average price is about 40 to 50 pounds. Well, that's that's a lot of kit for the money because I think retail it came out around 70 pounds when it first appeared at the end of last year. So, without further ado, let's have a little look at what we got here. So, some beautiful artwork, as you'll have already noted. Clearly, it looks like it's over uh, the Middle East, probably Iraq. And these wild weasels, of course, were used in the first Gulf War. Um, I, I can never quite get used to the fact... <laughs> this is the same with the F-15, but I can't quite get used to the fact that we have this Boeing licensing agreement. Because Boeing, uh, you know, it says McDonnell Douglas as the trademark, but of course it's now technically it's Boeing, because they bought McDonnell Douglas, and therefore the Eagles and the, the Phantom um, uh, trademarks, it's all part of their uh, global manufacturing conglomerate, so they, they get a a call out with the trademark and the licensing agreement um, but I just can't get used to it being Boeing you know it's just to me it's just McDonald Douglas Phantoms but there we go anyway so what we have got here we have got kit number uh, LS that's because it's the LS015 what do they have the, they have the pterodactyl thing I never quite get this with me now before we get any further into this I should just confront the elephant of the room at the beginning regarding Meng. Now I'm going to do one of these um, let's talk about various manufacturers and I've still got to do the Tamiya one I've got I'm just got a bit distracted with Telford and other things. It's coming don't worry it's coming we'll probably have that at Christmas I think that would be a nice way to round the year off um, but I'm also going to do one on Zokimura and I'm going to do one there are so many manufacturers and there's quite a lot that are in the Far East in China in particular China Korea so I'm going to do one where I just do. Uh, I'm not. I'm not massively experienced at every single manufacturer. I don't want to come across like I am. I'm not going to make positive or negative comments when I've got no experience. I think that would be completely unfair and not reasonable. So, however, Trumpeter. Uh, I've had dalliances with um, Meng. I have Kinetic, Hobby Boss, Great Wall Hobby, Academy. Oh, Danny Career, of course. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do one for these Far Eastern manufacturers, which Meng will be included in them. Um, but I just want to say about Meng that I have had a bit of a love-hate relationship with them, really. I have had some love and some hate. <laughs> and specifically, the love was with the, um, the Messerschmitt 163B Comet, the 30-second scale kit, the rocket uh, motor-propelled uh, air superiority interceptor from World War II, from 1944, uh, and 
Apart from one issue we had with that kit, I was pretty impressed with it, I've got to be honest, I really enjoyed it. It was actually a gift that somebody gave me, but it did have a flaw, there was a bit of an issue with the wing joining, uh, which wasn't wasn't great, and I've put, talked to other modellers and they've all had the same issue. But other than that, it was pretty good. I've got to be fair, it, I, was, I enjoyed building it and it looks fantastic now in the cabinet. Then, um, <laughs> then things went a bit downhill because we had the, the DR1 Fokker triplane, which was the X-Wing Wings kit of course. And uh, Meng had picked up, by whatever means, we won't get into that because we don't know, <clears throat> but Meng had picked up the moulds and issued it under their own name. Now I've got to say to you that when that came out and I got it right at the beginning and reviewed it and gave it, yeah, a fairly good review, but we had this, uh, I mean, I should explain first of all, it was about £70 when it came out, it was a lot of money. So it's now much cheaper than that, but it was not cheap when it came out and it got a bit of a lukewarm reception from me because I thought it was going to be wing nut wings and it clearly wasn't. The instructions were nothing like a wing nut wings kit at all. But worse than that was the issues with broken parts, which you can get round, you know, you can't fix them usually. Um, and the part con concerned could have been fixed and just glued, it was fine. But much more serious on the same sprue, sprue B, which was the middle wing, I think it was, had this horrendous warp in it. Now, I've had somebody say to me in the last week, oh, well, this is a non-issue. Uh, I just uh, got rid of that warp in five minutes. Well, yes, that, that may be true, um, but it depends on how much warp you got. And a lot of people um, who are selling this kit and reviewed it and, uh, and have said that I was um, completely over the top in my uh, negativity, if you like. Um, but... A, they completely misunderstood the... Well, I'm thinking one person in particular didn't even build the kit either uh, and didn't even notice the warp, which I thought was quite amusing. But the warp did vary, and the, the proof of the puddings and the eating at the end of the day. I complained to Meng. They sent me a further seven sprue bees from China that had never been in the box, because everybody was saying, oh, no, he's misunderstood, it's just the broken parts. It's, it's all because of the way they put them in the box. This is complete red herring. That was never the main issue with that kit. The main issue was the warpage. Um, and I know people that built it and built it successfully, but they've all had to do d varying degrees of repair work. Um, I got seven more sprues, I had eight in total, including the original one. Uh, and they were all warped to varying degrees with broken parts, and it was just a mess, quite frankly. It was just not qc properly. I was always convinced, and I remain convinced today, that that was actually outsourced, that the injection moulding, I mean, was outsourced by me, because they probably didn't have it in their schedule. They acquired it unexpectedly when Wing Nut Wings closed. However they did it, I'm not sure, but we won't get into that. But uh, it was something that was clearly unexpected, and it seemed to me so unlike their usual good quality, which they are pretty known for some great great quality kits, especially with their armour kits. And it was nothing like that. It was nothing like the Wing Nut Wings. The original sprue I saw, which I showed photographs of uh, at Telford in 2019, it was not warped at all. It was perfect. So something went seriously wrong and I fell out of love with Meng really because they kept sending me more that they still hadn't checked. This is the thing. If you're going to send somebody a replacement part, you check that it's not the same as the one he's just complained about. Duh, yeah? Anyway, so this, this has caused a bit of a fallout between Meng and I and, uh, and I've not really been um, very minded to go back and buy any of their stuff. I was interested in the Ayrton Senna McLaren Honda MP44, the 1988 McLaren Honda turbo car. Formula One car, uh, and it, I'm just mi mistrustful of them. So, so that, I'm just setting out my stall here. So I have got a bit of a, a bit of a checkered background with them, and uh, yeah, we've certainly had uh, one or two uh, issues uh, along the way. So, putting that aside, I'll keep an open mind today. I was trying to keep an open mind. Look at what's in the box. Yeah, let's hope it's more like their former uh, quality, not not that rather difficult. Uh, situation with the, uh, the triplane. So without further ado, I've set my stall out, let's have a look at what I've got the box. Now I've got to say straight away that I am very impressed with the box. I am. Because it's got this depth to it, it's very big and chunky and solid and it, you know there's not a lot of rattling or anything. They seem to pack it, it's quite heavy. So the, the initial impressions on, on getting this in my hand are very positive ones, so let's hope we can keep that going. Please, and please, oh god, let's have uh, again, I've, I've not opened it, so I don't know. I just hope the clear parts are going to be okay because I've had a bad run recently with doing reviews where clear parts have been a bit iffy, to put it mildly. Right, let's zoom you in. Enough chat, let's get into it. So, on the side, we have got a host of missiles. We've got 
AIM-7 um, Spyro missiles, AGM-65, AGM-78, AGM-88 anti-radar missiles. Oh, we've got all sorts of stuff going on there. There's tanks, we've got a crew ladder, so they're really, uh, they're really providing some quite impressive stuff here, actually. That uh, bodes well. Um, not too sure whether that's a computer render they've done or not, whether it's an actual kit, hard to tell. Kind of looks like it might be actual kit, but anyway, I'll look on the other side. Again, sort of same question here, really. I think by the lighting it's actually a computer render. But one thing they have done here, which I'm going to now enjoy reading to you, is they made a bit of an effort with the actual <coughs> um, presentation in that, and this is one of my big beefs, as you probably all know, with the Far Eastern manufacturers, um, even Academy have been guilty of this, not providing us with much in the way of data about the aircraft. And there have been so many of them, and I've been really cross about it. And of course, when we did the Sokimura recent uh, review, that was not an issue. <laughs> that was not an issue. And now there is it, of course, with Tamiya either. Anyway, let's read you. So we've got some proper writing here. So it's copyright 2022, and they're actually based in Hong Kong, uh, made in China these days, of course. So it says, the F-4G Wild Weasel was a US Air Force dedicated suppression of enemy air defence, S-E-A-D. Aircraft converted from the F-4E, just a long-nosed version. The aircraft first flew in 1975 and entered service with the US Air Force in 1978. The F-4E's nose-mounted uh, M61A1 Vulcan cannon was removed for the installation of the AN-ANPR radar homing and warning receiver, which you see here. <clears throat> and it had, which had 52 antennas in the frame. Okay. Uh, in, sorry, in the airframe. The F4G retained the ANAPQ120 radar in the nose, digital interception computer, electro -opt optical target identification system, which is in a pod, I think and other advanced avionic systems. It often carried electronic countermeasure pods and electro-optical targeting pod on the underwing hardpoints as well. Oh, so maybe I was wrong, it's probably, it's probably talking about the one that's in, under the nose. Um, and it goes on to say, the F4G could suppress en enemy air defences and jam and attack enemy air defence radars. It also had outstanding maneuverability and performed a variety of tasks by changing weapon stores. During the Gulf War in 1991, the F4G was only available, the only available US Air Force SEAD aircraft. I thought they had the, is that right? I thought they had the F111 as well. Didn't they have a wild weasel? Was that later? Okay, well, let's take them at their word. Anyway, information about the kit. <coughs> this kit, LSO. Uh, LS-015 is a McDonnell Douglas F4G Fanta Wild Weasel plastic mold kit and includes the AN-ALQ-119 ECM pods, AN-ALQ-131 ECM pods, weapons like AIM-7 air-to-air missiles and the AGM-88 HARM high-speed anti-radiation missiles. Leading edge slats and flaps can be installed, retracted or deployed. Uh, it has horizontal stabilizers which are movable, the cockpit its interior equipment and boarding ladder are precisely replicated. This sounds quite quite positive. The kit includes metal uh, metal pitot tube, pre-cut pre-cut stainless steel PE parts and painting masks, and provides you with three paint schemes. Okay, well, without further ado, let's have a look what's in the box then. Uh, we've also got a paint guide for AK Interactive on the side, which is quite helpful actually because I think AK have become one of the more popular ones. Let's pop that to one side. Oh. We have a Meng's Most Liked 2022. Oh, okay. Uh, mm, mm, this entry should be. Oh, it's a it's a, a, a modelling competition, in fact. Yeah, model and diorama. Enter a model or a diorama of which main product is the main part. And what you do, send a photograph. You scan the code and you enter this championship, and you can get 200 US dollars. It says. Oh. Gosh, very good, okay. Right, lots of plastic. Uh, and I should warn you, the only, that's, uh, I, have, I have opened the box briefly because we've got some bags that have got staples and some that haven't, I'll have to cut open, I'm afraid. 
David has given me clearance to do that, so we're okay, no problem. There. But I, thought, I was actually quite pleased at first because I thought they were all staple. I started move, removing them all and then found that you got halfway down and then the staple bags stopped and became sealed bags. So it does indicate it's perhaps one of several versions that Menga produces, doesn't it? Righty ho! Now then, let's see what we have got here. <coughs> Time for a quick slurp, I think. Anyway, um, as we're on the on the cusp of December almost, let's just drink to it. Let's hope we have many interesting kits coming out in the next 12 months. We have we are still waiting for quite a number of kits to come out this year. I can think of three straight away that are overdue, but um, anyway, we'll see. We'll see how we get on. I'm going to be reviewing a British one and probably two two from Japan very soon. Um, and then that's probably it for this year, I think, in terms of reviews. So, uh, anyway, I hope, you, I hope you enjoy the reviews this year. I've certainly done uh, a lot of them. Sorry, I'm saying that. I'm completely forgetting my friends at ICM in the Ukraine, for which I apologise. Uh, I was thinking about the other kits that I've actually paid for. <laughs> um, but we've got quite a number coming from ICM in the Ukraine. Um, the bad news is that the um, 148 scale B26 Marauder that won't come through until after Christmas, so sometime early in the new year, I think. Anyway, cheers, cheers to ICM. Uh, good, good health to them, and best wishes over to their, them and their countrymen, and good health to you all too. Enjoy, nice to have a, a slurp for a change. Mmm. Mmm. Yes, <clears throat> it's quite rich, this McGuigan's Black Label. Potent Shiraz, actually. <coughs> right. Let us get down to well. This is this is quite nice. We've got a lot of very sort of Tamiyar almost styled um, booklet. It seems really nice. Let me see if I can. I think I'm going to have to move some of these back a bit because they might be in the way. Oh, clear parts. Oh, I get, I get a bit faint now when I see clear parts. Just not had a good run, have we, with them? <laughs> a whole sequence of kits where I had poor ones. Right then. So we've had a bit of a write-up already, so we don't need that, so we'll just shoot straight into this. Okay, here we go. Zoom you in. Okay. So, we've got what looks like um, some decals for the cockpit uh, switches. So you're going to start with your cockpit uh, tub, uh, assembling the two sides, of course, with all your various controls and switches. You've got your uh, rudder pedals going in there. Then you've got the, the back bulkhead coming in behind uh, the co-pilot. Uh, stroke navigator, I suppose he's, he's the weapons officer, isn't he? And the uh, jamming officer in this in this case. <coughs> I suppose you call him the wizard. Would you call him wizard? Yeah. And then we've got the instruments. We've got throttle, looks like throttle controls. Then we've got your um, computer screen instrumentation here for the, both the pilot and then the weapons officer. Uh, you've got your control sticks coming in here and your ejector seat, uh, you can almost call them the ladder rail on which the ejector seat will launch. And then it sort of zooms away from the cockpit a little bit and it actually installs that tub into the top of the fuselage which looks like it's looks like it's a one-piece one, doesn't it? We'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then you've got uh, and you've got what looks like an avionics bay going in there, is it? Avionics bay? I think it is. And then we've got our um, horizontal stabilizers coming in. Now I like the fact that Meng are, Meng are doing what, I, again, they're doing quite well here. They're, they're, they're giving you a title. This is what I've talked to people like ICM about, because they don't have a title at the start of the actual um, uh, section as a guide to tell you what you're actually fitting. I mean, obviously here it's a little bit more obvious, but when you get in some of the fine detail parts, sometimes it's not that, not always that clear on certain certain kits. But here they've made it abundantly clear what we're doing, and you're gonna you've got a, a lower section here uh, with the heat resistance section from the back of the engines, obviously, and you've got your tailplanes going in there, horizontal stabilizers, and the whole assembly goes in and is attached to the the upper fuselage, complete with a a little pivoting system which you won't cement so that you, you have all moving tailplanes. And again here we've got the explanation coming in. Auxiliary air take and landing gear bay assembly. 
So, you know, you're in no doubt what you're doing. Starboard, I like it, this is great. Starboard, port, main landing, gear assembly, it's all clear, isn't it? So you're building up all your bays and then popping those in there. Then we've got our mini uh, air intake ducting coming in. So you've got the, um, uh, the back of the engines you're going to build up. And at least, unlike the Hasegawa kit, um, was it Hasegawa or was it the Zokimura where it's actually, you can actually see through if you're not careful. I think it might be Zokimura actually. <coughs> or was it? No, I think it was Hasegawa. Anyway, um, no problems like that here. It's clearly blocked off so there's not a problem when you're looking through it. And then you've got the sort of conventional sort of system. I think it's a bit more like Academy, isn't it? Where you've got the uh, everything being built upon the lower level, so to speak, with the lower central fuselage all attached to the wings as one piece. And then you're dropping in your, your wings and your wing extensions, wingtip extensions here. <coughs> and then, yes indeed, we have got a one piece as I thought. The That's good, isn't it? That's like uh, Academy, isn't it? They do that, not not like the Zokimura or the Hasegawa that we saw before. So you've got one great big uh, fuselage top coming down, mating into the lower uh, to meet the engines and intakes and wings. Then you're building in your air intakes and your baffles coming in there. And then their starboard and port side are going on, as you can see. It's a big old book, is this? I like, I like this. It's yeah, it's a nice instruction book, that's clear. It's almost Airfix-like in some respects with the colours they're using, things like that. Uh, and, and it's got more information than Airfix, actually, because it's got, you know, written data. So it's got all your flaps, outboard and inboard flaps going in, and you've got the option of having them retracted or extended. So obviously you're going to decide on that. Pop those in there. Then you've got your exhaust jet nozzles and your arrestor hook. Which looks pretty cool. So I'm just going to see if I can adjust my lighting here because one of my lights it seems to be a little bit faint. No, I think it's just we have a bit of a flattened battery on that one. It's not quite as bright as I would have liked. I don't mind. Anyway, then we're going to put, bring in our uh, vertical fin, uh, complete with rudder, which is a separate piece. Which again, I guess if you wanted to, you could pose. I'm not sure it's supposed to be posed, but I bet you could. Then you've got the. Um, You've got the tail cone there, which obviously they can use a parachute if they need to. And <clears throat> then we get into our leading edges where we've got these extendable flaps. You can have them retracted or, or extended. The same on the other side, which is really nice, isn't it? I mean, this is a proper premium sort of kit. It's got everything, hasn't it, really? Then you've got all your gear bay doors going in here, complete with their actuators. And then you've got your... Um, Air brake panels because it has these huge air brakes underneath the fan to, to slow it down. Same on the other side, complete the actuator rod. And then we're going to build our gear, <coughs> main gear up, uh, complete with the leg and the door and the actuator rod for that as well. Same on the opposite side, uh, going onto the uh, main landing gear which is on the starboard side. And then you've got your main front gear here with your twin twin wheels and tyres and the oleo leg and your actuator control rod and suspension built in and then obviously you're going to build up your doors open or closed. Probably going to go open aren't you I think. Um, so much detail in this model I think you would probably, probably don't want to do this when you're flight I think. Then we've got the Ray Dome, one of the, this is one part of the Wild Weasel set. Uh, and then you've got um, like a, a cover here, like a, these are the air intakes, I think it mentioned earlier. Additional air intakes for all the equipment inside. And then you've got your ventral, uh, you've got, or your stores, so you've got your pylons, you've got a um, ventral external tank and a port side and a starboard side tank as well. Obviously there are options around which you fit. Port main wing pylon, these look really good, don't they? Look at that. Complete with sway braces and the attachment points. And I'm quite sure what these things are at the back. I'm not very familiar with that. They look like some kind of electronics system. It could actually be uh, electronic countermeasures dispenser, I think. It looks like a little pod of dispenser. 
material. Then you've got your, um, your anti-radar missiles, AGM-88, going on to their pylons there. And then we've got our AGM, these are laser guided bombs basically. Uh, AGM-65s, AGM-78, and AIM-7, which of course is the air-to-air sidewinders. And then the, the, the electronic countermeasures pods, the ANALQ-119 and the 131. And we've got external stores here. So this is where it's giving you the different options of all the different variations you can have. Absolutely brilliant. I mean, that's just fantastic. It's, it's, again, it's detailing which what, what everything is. It's very clearly labelled. Just what's lacking in so many of the other kits, isn't it, really? And then uh, we sort of jump back to the cockpit now. We're going back to... <laughs> which I think... Was it, was it the uh, Zerky Mora? I can't remember. One of the others that did this, where it suddenly went back to the cockpit later. And we're going to build up our ejection seats, complete with the uh, quick-release handles at the top, headrests and the combing for the instrumentation plus the gun sight and then you've got your um, centre section, uh, your windscreen going in there, clear part, and then you've got your centre section between the uh, pilot and navigator strap weapons officer and then you're building up your canopies which come on a nice frame um, yeah that's uh, and they've done the glass in such a way that it includes, a bit like Tamiya do it, it does include a bit of the outer frame work. So I don't think painting is going to be a problem as long as you've got masks, which I know we have, in the kit. So it's just looking, I'm warming to this a lot, um, because it's just nothing like the Ming triplane, which I moaned about, and bitterly disappointed in it on different levels, really. I thought it was, especially when it was £70, I thought it was absurd and not good enough. This is just curing all those issues in you know one by one uh, they're just not coming up at all so there you go you're putting on your canopies <coughs> then we've got our uh, accru axis ladder going in as well you've got the option to have the canopy shut or with the extender uh, rods that uh, sort of wedges it open and then I believe this is a metal part isn't it the pitot tubes and you've got a short version and a long version Two different versions. Um, doesn't make it entirely clear about what the options are or why there, if I'm honest. Unless I'm really missing something. That might need a little bit more research. And then finally, that's, so that's it, you're finished. Um, wow, that's quite uh, impressive. That is quite impressive. So then we've got our sprue map, strangely at the back. I don't know why, why some of these guys put them at the end. I think that's better at the front, really. And then we've got our colour call out. So we've got um, Lieutenant Commander Mark Turberville, Electronic Warfare Officer Jim Yukon of the 561st Fighter Squadron based at Dahran in Saudi Arabia and that was in 1996, that was after the Gulf War obviously uh, obviously helping to keep the peace and make sure there was no further trouble from Iraq at that point and then on the next one we have got um, Colonel R. Pekens, Pekens Peck Sense, pardon. Ah, Peck Sense Weasel, Weasel Electronic Officer Unknown, and this is an Insulik in Turkey in March 91, so this is just basically just uh, after the end of the Gulf War, really, uh, after it finished. Probably where they withdrew to. Third one, and here we've got more of a, uh, more of a European type scheme, camo scheme. Lieutenant Commander Kopner and Electronics, Electronics Officer, Officer Captain Leggett of the 81st Fighter Squadron and that is at uh, Spangeldarm Air Force Base in Germany in July 87. Very done. And then you've got all the uh, call-outs for all your stencils and decals that are going to go onto your... Oh, there's quite a few, isn't there? Onto all the weapons and the stools, tanks, etc. And then, and then we've got some, yes, then we've got some masks now. I like this. I like this. This, are they actually pre-cut out as well? Looks like there might be something quite interesting going on here, which I haven't seen before. So they seem to be pre-cut. And then you've got all your colours. So I've got to say, I mean, we haven't seen the plastic yet, of course. But I've got to say that so far, I am very 
enthused by this because that is a that is a really nice instruction book. Pretty much all the grumbles and criticisms I always have don't exist here. They've done a really fine job with that, I think. That's really good work. So a very good start, I'd say. A very good start. So let's have a look at the old decals. And oh we've got some more, more bits in here as well. I think there's a little bit of photo actually, I don't think much of it. <laughs> oh this is the oh this is the masks. Let's look at this. Oh now then, this is interesting. This is something I haven't seen before. I haven't bought a lot of Meng aircraft, it has to be said. Any in fact. Uh, apart from that ME163, which I say was a gift. So what we have here, I believe, I believe this is a sheet sheet of either polyester or polypropylene, probably the former, and they've actually already stripped away the waste, uh, as we would call it, in the label industry, which I used to be in. <laughs> they've stripped away the waste just to leave you with the, the raw mask, ready to just be peeled off and used immediately without having to fiddle around and, you know, what it's like normally, you've got to sort of dig about with tweezers and Maybe you might have to use a really, really sharp blade to try and get at them, which is always a real nightmare, to be honest. Can be. Or in the case of, you know, Tamiyar and some others, you've got to cut them out yourself. In the case of ICM and Airfix and others, you don't get any at all. So there's, there's like different classes of <laughs> have included uh, masks in these kits. I have to say that is the best I've ever seen as a concept. I don't know what they, what they come off like. I'm not going to try because it's not my kit. But as a concept, I think that's the that's the best solution yet for masks. I think that's probably going to be really easy to use, and I really like what they've done there. So it gets a ten out of ten on the mask, if nothing else. So I'll put that away safely, and then we'll have a look at what else we got. We've got this. Oh, we've got these tiny little metal parts, and hmm, okay. So what's puzzled me slightly is we clearly have a photo etch piece, but we also have. I think the photo edge piece is actually for the gear bay doors. And if I zoom you in here, have a look at this, uh, what else is in the bag? We've got the pito head, pito tube. I get the reflections off it. Can you see that? Now that pito tube, but remember I was looking at the instructions and there appeared to be two different sizes. So I'm wondering if there's a plastic one as well, perhaps included in the kit, and you get the option of using one or the other. Um, I didn't really feel was the one thing in the instructions that wasn't ultra clear, I thought. But anyway, then we just got these little bits of photo etch, which are, I think, the inside of the uh, sort of protective uh, plates on the inside of the, the gear doors, protecting the wheels and tyres, uh, protecting the door, shall we say. And then we've got our, our decals, so let's have a look at those. Um, so these are, oh, they're, they're okay, they're printed by Cartograph in Italy. They're doing everything right with this kit so far, pretty much, aren't they? Look at that. So we've got minimal excess carrier film. And we've got some really nicely printed stuff going on here. So you've got your low-vis American markings. Rather angry looking tiger, is that? Is, that, um, is it a tiger? My, my, my sight's not good enough at this range. It looks like, I can't tell if it's a tiger or some sort of dragon. Then we've got some shark's mouth going on, or at least like a dragon's mouth. And over here we've got a shark's mouth. Which are nice, aren't they? They're really clean, and you've got some really, yeah, beautifully produced decals there. But of course, being a phantom, it's got a lot of stencils. Plenty to keep you busy on long, dark winter's nights there, I think. Uh, complete with as I was right about the instrumentation. There's the instrumentation panels in there. Actually, it's quite nice, doesn't it? Yeah. But no, they've done it well. Nice, nice decals. There's some instrumentation screen as well. And then there's more of them along the bottom. Instrumentation. Okay. CFT screens, and then you've got various, uh, this is for your stores, uh, stencils, yep, absolutely fantastic. Right, so, 
Well, I, I get another big tick, I think, for the decals because they've gone cartograph, and how you wish that someone like Edward would do that, you know. It's just logical, isn't it? If you've got something in the industry that's competitive and is able to manufacture for anybody, then why would you not go to them? Why would you reinvent the wheel and create something that doesn't really work very well? Unless all the planets are aligned. Anyway, I've said my piece on that already. That is a very nice bit of nice bit of decal work. So, without further ado, I'll get these big ones out, start with them I think. We'll start with all the ones that are staple, that would make sense, wouldn't it really? So let's just go with those. I'm just going to endure, or enjoy I should say. <laughs> it's not an endurance. Another sip of the McGuigan Shiraz. Cheers. Hope you enjoy a drink as well. Mmm. Mmm. Very nice. Mmm. Right. So, start with the biggest, I think. Which is lower fuselage and lower wings. Let's see what you think of this. Now then. Now, I've got to bear in mind our recent Zukimura kit, which was very, very nice, I have to say. Very nice Phantom. Now, what have we got here? So, we've got this is the area where it has these additional intakes, air intakes. Uh, replacing its cannon. You've got some beautiful panel line in here. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Now then, that is, well, it's as good as Tamiyar, isn't it? It's as good as Tamiyar, right up there with Okimura. There's a sort of a consistency to it, isn't there, as well. Uh, so look at the detail, even in these uh, recesses for the air brakes, the finely detail, that, that's very nicely done. I mean, that's just lovely, to be honest. Can't fault it. How would you improve on that, do you think? I'm not too sure. Um, one thing I would say on the inside that this particular example seems to have got, I don't know if you made this out, just seems to have got, there's a bend there, that's a little bit of damage in transit. Uh, don't, don't break it, Peter. We all know what happens when you touch people. I'm going to leave it. I'm, I don't want to break it on camera. It will never be forgotten if I do. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's just, you see how it's got a bend? You see it's got a stress mark in it. That'll soon bend back. Bend it back and then apply a bit of liquid extra thin, it'll be absolutely fine. But that seems to be in transit that that's happened. Now one thing I will say, um, uh, if you bear in mind, we were looking at that um, academy last week, weren't we? The Rafale. And they had a situation like that. They had a, a little antenna which was pre-moulded on the outside of the un underneath of the fuselage chin. And they'd actually put like a little, incredibly, they'd put this little piece of um, uh, uh, self-adhesive foam to protect it, like, like an automotive foam type of product. And they'd actually put it at the side so it couldn't get bashed. That really showed attention to detail. Uh, that, that's one thing that men have missed out on. And whether it's been just badly handled, I don't know. It's not me, God, honest. That's the first time I've had it out of the bag, so hmm. it's not a problem though. Don't dwell on that, that's fixed in that 10 seconds. Gently bent back, just warm it up, bend it back, and apply a little bit of glue just to solidify it and you'll be good to go. Not a problem. So that's the first thing. And that was beautifully finished and made, I thought. Nice moment. And then, then we've got, yes, it's a one piece, great big full length. It's quite big, isn't it? Full length fuselage on the actual, all the way down the spine. Um, now, if you remember that the Zukimura was actually in two halves, uh, and I think even the, obviously the Hasegawa is in two halves as well, which is one of its weaknesses in a way. But the Tamiya was in two halves, but had set different sections that were inserted. This is this is not going to need that because it's already, you know, in the right. Uh, you know, they're not trying to make it a kit that's going to be of multiple applications. And you can see there that it's got the, that's where they have the refueling door, isn't it? Which I never quite understand about. Perhaps somebody can uh, 
perhaps some of our American friends can enlighten me on this. This business about refueling, in-flight refueling, it looks very hazardous on the American aircraft like this and the F-15 and many others. And they have, they've got to aim this great big refueling rod, you know, a great big, like a petrol hose in the sky, but in a solid metal extendable telescopic tube. And then they've got to make it slot exactly into this hole. It seems very perilous to me. And of course there have been videos where it's gone wrong and they've broken off and things. I always thought that the... Um, I mean, I'm no expert, as I say, but to me, for simplicity and safety, I always thought that the system that used to be used, which was used by the Brits, where they had the sort of drogue, drogue and parachute, um, like a basket system, so it's like, um, it's almost like a, a conical shaped basket uh, with like a, and the drogue comes out and they just unwind it and then they have a, obviously a, a refueling probe like they have on the Phantom or other aircraft like the Jaguar or the Eurofighter or the Tornado have one that extends. Rafales and Buccaneers and things like that have it permanently fixed and then they just slot it in. They fly up to it and slot it in. I'm not saying that's a better system but it just looks a lot safer to me than this thing where they have to get it absolutely blue perfect dead on especially when it's behind you as well. I, mean, I realise that the refueling team are guiding the pilot but it just looks perilous, it really does to me, so perilous. It scares me every time I see one of those in-flight refueling videos, but I'm digressing. Back to the kit anyway, <laughs> for my insecurities. Good job I wasn't in the Air Force, isn't it? Anyway, let's take a closer look at this. So obviously they've had to mould it in one single piece, which is no mean feat. Something this big uh, and this detailed, so let's have a check it out. Um, got to say that the panel line detail there... That is pretty impressive. That really is crisp, isn't it? Can we see any flaws? I'm not spotting any that's jumping out at me at all, really. No. Um, it's very consistent, isn't it, as well? Is it? Is the lining about right, would you say? Is it overdone? Underdone? It's a bit heavy there, but overall... There's a real nice, crisp consistency to it, isn't there? And there's that refueling door look in the middle. <laughs> and then the other side will check that out as well. Yes. That's really nice. And you know, the consistency of the panel lining goes right down to the bottom, doesn't it? It doesn't sort of vary in depth or any of that nonsense. That's very nice. That's a lovely, you know, for a single largely moulded piece, which is not going to be easy to do. And they seem to have achieved that rather well, I think. So, so far so good. I have to say I'm more impressed with this than I anticipated I was going to be, so far. So don't let me down now. What have we got here? Now, here we've got what looks like the tail, vertical tail fins. Again, really nice. Look at this. Look at this, got the instruments to look at as well here, look at that. Now then, obviously we've got our rudder that goes on the back here. Got those recessed rivets, they've got that absolutely super crisp, haven't they? Same on the other side. And then you've got one of your pods here, is it the 119 pod? I think it is. And then just invert it so we can see the instrumentation. That's nice as well, isn't it? That's very, very nicely done. I think get a bit closer. That's super crisp. I mean, that looks a bit sharper than Tamiya, I would say, which is quite a compliment, especially coming from me. Yeah, don't forget, <clears throat> don't forget Mr. Tamiya ring, rang me the other week, didn't he? Because he only rang me because he wanted me to be objective. He was worried I was just going to be like a little little girl fanboy over his products. <laughs> very likely, very likely. 
that's one for you to look forward to, isn't it? That that video <laughs> coming soon. <laughs> okay, here we go with the the Sparrow missile, and this has been clearly been slide moulded. Look, you can see the the way they've done the tailpipe recessed very very nicely there. That's really really good, isn't it? Look at that. And then we've got uh, also the front uh, front tail fins. And there's four of those, so we won't dwell on all four of them. All identical. Then we've got, oh, we've got one that I've missed here. We've got uh, another bag that I didn't manage to spot that's also got some uh, staples in it. Staples I did not spot. So for that. So Ooh, weird. So we've got the front uh, ray dome that's going to go under the chin. Let's see if we can get in nice and close on this because this again has got some very exquisite detail on it. Look at that. That's the front. Nice, isn't it? Then we've got our uh, rear uh, sort of heat shielded lower tail area. Obviously, with the heat shielding for the engine, and this has got again, this has got some very exquisite moulding. It's all like a ribbing effect, isn't it? Like it's an, uh, to, to help dissipate the heat is the idea here. Look at that. Is really really nice. It's the, I mean, is this the best Phantom of the lot? It's certainly looking that way to me. Uh, people say that the Meng aircraft kits go together really well. I know the F-18 has got a good reputation, hasn't it? Uh, the Hornet that they did. Look at that. You've got your place obviously for your, your tail planes and your, your pivot piece goes in here. So that's very nice. Then we've got our air intakes for the front. Oops. Uh, front air intakes. And again, fantastic panel lining detail here. Absolutely exquisite. That's gorgeous. Same on the other side. Yeah, absolutely superb. So that is a very nice little bag of goodies. Which we'll pop back together like so. Pop that back in its bag. It's one of those kits already that makes me think I'd like to build. I would like to build it. Um, why do we seem to be a bag short? Not sure what occurred there. All these little missiles, I think they're going to have to go in that one. There's not, there's a separate bag. Not anything. How odd. Not to worry. There's plenty of room in that bag. Yeah, I think they were in that one originally now. Now I think about it. That looks like the way that they arrived, so that's fine. That one, that one. <coughs> now then, um, some more weapons and another heavily multiple sprue, in fact there's one, two, three, four, six of these, would you believe? So this is your, your laser guided bombs. And again, very nicely produced. Look at that. I mean this is almost like Great Wall Hobby Standard really, except that they, they tend to do it in one piece, or they did do, until they produced that recent 14B Tomcat, which they, did, they, they went and changed everything, made it very, very parts heavy, high part cap for some reason, which I didn't really understand. But, uh, that's very, very nice. And um, as I say, there are no less than six of these. So there's obviously six of these weapons on the aircraft. 
So I'll skip past the rest of them because I've seen it. Yep, they are all the same, yes indeed. So, let's get to... This is now I'm going to start opening bags um, with a knife. Sorry David. <laughs> I think I deserve a drink before I get the blade out to calm my nerves and stop my hand from quivering. Or will it make it worse? Mm -hmm. Mm. Let's get the blade out. David, look away now. No, that way, that way. Okay. Now then, we've got some additional clear parts. Now these clear parts, interestingly, are basically just the little windows for the laser guided bombs. The, uh, the nose windows. Can you see this? Yes. Oh, those are quite nice. There's full, uh, one, two, three, three bags. There's actually six sprues in, in effect. There's two in a bag. Six sprues of that. Then we have got the big tanks and the intakes. So a lot of similar sort of shaped parts. Mm, okay, now, okay, and I found the very first negative of the kit. It may not matter, but look at the injection pins marks on the inside of the trunking. I was kind of hoping that we weren't going to have that. Um, now, whether you'll see them, because that, 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 that more open section is toward the rear, going backwards. So, effectively, you'd be looking at these that way, if you look down them. So whether you'll actually see them, you could argue it's not that, not that critical. However, you might just want to give it a quick swipe. They're not, they're not a bad. They're quite smooth actually, in fairness. They're not very steep. Oh, that one maybe. That one, oh, that one is a bit steeper. That's interesting, isn't it? That's a bit steep on that side. See that difference between that one and that one? So, yeah, but you're, so you're looking at it that way, um, but you've got the same over on this side, I think, haven't you? And you've got a similarity there in the way they've gone about it, so perhaps you can argue that's done deliberately. So uh, perhaps it's not such a big issue. Perhaps it's not. Perhaps I shouldn't be too harsh on them for that. Whether I'll dock them a quarter of a point, I'm not sure. I might turn a blind eye because I'm so impressed with everything else. You've got your baffle plates here for your intakes, um, which don't seem to have any great detail on them, which I thought they might have more. So they usually had um, porous, like multiple holes on them, didn't they, to reduce the sound of the air, uh, slow the air down as it went in. And then you've got your various tanks, of course, and also we have one of the pods. I forget which one it is now. The short of the two pods. And you've got some very nice detail here on your pylons. Excellent there. So it's a nice sprue that just a little bit. Just a bit surprised we got those to get pins on those, uh, those intake trunking. That was just wasn't quite expecting that. It seems to be there for keeping with the rest of the kit. But we will not dwell on that too much. Now then, we have another here. Some more fine detail. I'll go back to the opening. Again, I shall do my best to be careful with. Interestingly, we don't seem to have any na nasty ejector pins on this one, where they should not be. On either side, that's, they've done that really well. Well, that puzzles me slightly because they've gone and they've gone for the Zoki Mora style. Let me show you what I'm talking about. They've gone for the Zoki Mora style of having these lugs here, ejector pin lugs that you then cut off to avoid problems of having ejector pins. And if you look on some of these. Uh, some of these, this is the inside face, and there's no ejector pins there. If you turn it round, you can see on the outside face there's no ejector pins on those either. So they've done that very cleverly and uh, with real skill. So 
quite like that to be so crude on that uh, internal trunking, I'm not sure. Anyway, let's move on, because this sprue looks really impressive, got to say. But again, we've got the doors. Now they have got an injector pin or two, haven't they? Maybe I've spoken a bit too soon. Can you see them? Hmm. Fairly smooth, fairly smooth. Not, not severe ones, these, but they're there, aren't they? Can you see them? There, right? Hmm. I would have liked to have seen it without those, if I'm being honest. Then we've got our nose, which appears to have. It looks like it's been slide moulded, doesn't it? Because it's got like uh, graduations. Can you see that? Interesting. Very interesting. So that's the Phantom's nose. And we've got the internals for our cockpit. Lots of ejector pins here, but it doesn't matter because they're all covered in panels. <coughs> so that won't be seen at all. Um, well, some of the fine parts are really beautifully, meticulously been moulded. I mean, look at the uh, front gear leg there, the Olio. That's nice. We've got our couple of ejector pins appearing here on the rear bulkhead, but again that's completely invisible because you've got the ejector sheet rail it's going to cover that up. I think that way might be easy to understand. There we go, it's the right way up there. Uh, so yes, you've got two ejector pins, but again, irrelevant because they're going to be completely masked and covered, so that's not a problem. But they don't seem to have gone for pins on other more sensitive parts. Um, so it's strange that they've sort of suffered them in some places and not in others. And, uh, ah, okay, now I stand corrected on the other thing. Here are the baffles with all the many little holes I referred to. So those actually, the, the other side must just be the blanking reverse side for that side. So uh, forget what I said about the lack of detail, that, that isn't really true. Uh, you can clearly see we've got these uh, sort of supersonic baffles there on the intake uh, ramps. Not a problem. And then over here we've got a hydraulic, hydraulic actuator, I think that's for, I think that's for the, uh, the nose leg. And some very, very fine parts with lots of incredibly sharp details. I think you'll agree. Nothing wrong with that one at all. So that is uh, that uh, sprue, sprue B, in fact. It's a little bit strange, this ejector pin thing. I think perhaps, given their gene, I think they've thought it through more than is apparent in terms. I don't think that many of them are ever going to be seen. So it shouldn't be too harsh. Ooh, try to put this way, I haven't done it yet. Okay, so here we've got the uh, all-moving tail planes, and uh, it's funny, funny, funny it looks a bit greasy to be honest, can you see that? Um, slight greasiness to it, is that, I wonder if that's release agent, I can't see if it's, especially on this side, a bit there as well, but, tell. I think I'd be very tempted to give this a bit of a wash, some of these parts, because I think they've used a fair bit of release agent to try and get them out of the mould. <clears throat> there you've got your impressive great arrestor hook. Look at that. Wow. It's a big meaty one, isn't it? And then you've got your, looks like your rudder over here. Put the tail plane, vertical tail plane. Various uh, parts here for the... Uh, Hydraulic system, I think it is, and yeah, and that's the other side of the base of the arrestor hook. Nice little sprue. Yeah, you turn over, so you can see again how they've avoided the ejector pins. They've gone and ah, so inter interestingly, they've got the uh, the all moving tail plane. If you look very closely, has actually got its slats out. Can you see there? Can you see the leading edge? So the slats extended on it. It's like in a takeoff or landing position, isn't it? But I was just going to say they've obviously put these. Uh, I'm just coming a bit loose there. These ejector pin uh, lugs to try and avoid ejector pins on the part, which is fair enough. That's what we like to see. That's very much in the style of our friends at Zuki Mura. They seem to have almost pioneered that, don't they? That is a very nice sprue indeed. Be a bit wary about the uh, potential grease agent that's on it. And then. Lots of, lots of plastic here. I mean, to get this for about 40 or 50 quid, but I'd a lot of muddle here. 
Three years. A lower, lower, lower model, some of what would say. And these are very crinkly, these bags, it's not the best for sound quality. Uh, so this is your anti-radiation missile. And uh, you can tell them because they have these much bigger fins, of course, on the mid fin. Well, you could call it the forward fin, couldn't you? Huge, aren't they? Those are nicely moulded, aren't they? Very impressive. Got the rear fins here and the front fins there. Complete with its pylon as well. Very nice. Two of those. And then over here, we've got quite a big sprue for the wings. So we've got the, um, the top wing, basically you've got the top wing here, and then you've got your, um, how does it work? Dun, 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 which way up is it? That's the real question, isn't it? Decide which side is up. <laughs> I'm guessing that that goes with that. So yeah, uh, the wing, uh, the wing tips, and of course they they tuned them up on the Phantom. It was originally going to have a straight wing, and these tips were not going to be up at this angle, um, which they ended up doing. But uh, they found that the, it reduced the drag effect, and it gave them better lift at the slow speeds. So it's something they modified later. Um, I mean, in terms of the actual surface detail, it's magnificent, isn't it? Look at that. It's a little closer. Oh, nice look at this. The panel line detail and the riveting and the, the finesse of it is absolutely something to behold, isn't it? Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. And then we've got our slats here, leading edge slats for both. And then you've got your flaps. It's quite an impressive sprue, is that, to be honest. Yes, I like it. I like it a lot. Very, very nice indeed. So, put that back in there. Just a couple more bags to go, uh, and we've got one here which is a duplicate. Uh, I think we might have another one on those as well. Let's just try and do a better job of the cutting of the bag this time. Better if, the, uh, yeah, right, it's better if I cut it on the clear side that's not got the flap. <laughs> right, this is a duplicate, so there's two of these. So, what we have here, we've got the engines, the rear engines, uh, complete with the afterburn ring. Is here and some really nice detail there for the jet pipe. Um, but I say afterburner ring, that's technically the afterburner ring itself, isn't it? Look at that, isn't that nice? And then you've got the intake uh, fan blade here for the engines, compressor. Presser blades, and you've got your ejector seats, which look pretty fine, I've got to say, for injection moulded plastic. That's almost resin quality, isn't it? Then you've got your framework for your canopy, the lifter for the canopy, and you've got your ejector seat handle poles there. And then you've got your sort of turkey feathers for the actual exhaust pipes at the back. Engine exhausts. And then you've got some very fine looking wheels. That's really, really detailed, isn't it? Look at that. There's, part, there's the central part of the seat. Beautiful. Really nice sprue that is. Now look at what they've done here, which they didn't do on that other main piece. Look at how they've protected that part 
with like a, a little wall they've built into the into the actual sprue frame so that part can be vertical without getting damaged isn't that clever yes we saw something like that I think on the Zokimura if I remember correctly that's, that's a very intelligent way of going about it isn't it excellent so that's that one and then there's just one remaining bag of the grey sprues and then we're into the clear parts which I'm putting off because keep your fingers crossed Right now, I've learned how to cut these bags. I don't do it that way, I put it this way up. Best of it if I go in this direction. I think I've got, I've got this sus now. Now I've got to the end. <laughs> this makes perfect, you know. And here we've got one of our, I think it's the other type of anti radiation missile. <coughs> Those are fine, aren't they? Those are fine. Wow, that's very nice. There's two of those, and then we have green screen. Whoops, there we go. <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. And then we've got all the ancillary little bits. So we've got things like the crew ladder and the outside of the canopy frames. So let's go through them one by one. There we go, that's part of the canopy framing. Got all these very small parts here now. Things like the pedals, there's the rudder pedals. Various parts are so small I'm not even sure what they are. Then we've got our canopy frames, look, for, for the front and the rear. Uh, in fact that's the front one isn't it I think, and that's the rear one, I think I'm right. And then we've got our crew access ladder, which looks very nice doesn't it? And then we've got some very detailed looking pylons here. Some great panel line detail and riveting on it. And then we've got some of the instrumentation uh, in the cockpit panels. A bit closer. There we go, that's better. And then we've got various little bits of uh, actuator rods. And we've got the cockpit combing for the front top of the cockpit where the gun sight's going to go. Um, part of the ladder, I think that is there. This one, top of the ladder. Instrumentation, the navigator and uh, weapons officer. Wild weasel officer, I think they call them, don't they? <laughs> And then there's various parts of like actuators and support uh, clamps for the uh, undercarriage. And I think that's the nose of one of the uh, the ray dome, is it? Nose? One of the pods. Some beautiful, very, very fine moulding. Very, very exquisitely done. Um, yeah. Apart from that slight question mark in my mind about the ejector pins. I don't know whether I'm being a bit harsh about it really because uh, I've got a hunch that they're not going to be visible. In fairness to Meng, I think they knew that. I think they knew that. Now, you know, when I look at a kit like this and I think back again to talking about this, uh, <laughs> this is like the Sea Harry for me, I can't let it go, you know. Uh, but the Meng, the DR1 triplane, which they made such a mess of really. It didn't seem that beautifully moulded as we'd expected. It wasn't comparable to the Wingnut Wings uh, sprue, which I actually saw the original one. It wasn't the same. You can tell it not been, hadn't been done in the same place. Um, and now we see this, which is chalk and cheese. I mean, this is way superior. So, I'm sorry folks, but I'm not wrong. Uh, I say again to you, I'm absolutely convinced that Meng subcontracted that because they probably were already committed at their factories producing other new kits. Uh, was it 2021 I think it came out? <clears throat> There's no way that they produced that from the same factory as this, I don't believe that for a second. Anyway, finally, clear parts of oh, cross everything, cross everything. Because this is always the thing that seems to, especially recently, I seem to have a, a jinx on clear parts. So let's see what we've got. Staples out. 
Now we do have a cent centre line seam, which I'm never very keen on, but they can usually be removed fairly easily if you're very, very careful. All you do, you'll see it here in a second, what you do, and what I do, you see it just in the dead centre there, make it out. It's very faint, but it's there. Yeah, you can feel it. Very faint. Um, what I can't quite understand though, oh, I was going to say there's not one at the back, but there is. It's even fainter. I'm not sure the camera's going to get this. Can you see it? I think you can just make it out there. A tiny faint seam. So in fairness to them, they've got it very faint, much fainter than Tamiya managed in fairness, and certainly better than Ravel and others. But in terms of the, let's have a look at do a distortion test. I've got to say, in fairness, this is looking very promising. Let's just get my remote controller and see what we get. So let's get it like that first of all now then. Unfortunately, the uh, camera's going to do strange things. Distortion test. Yeah, and remember it's, it's a bubble canopy, so it's always going to have some distortion to a degree. I'm not sure that's helping us really. You'll have to be guided by me a bit more, I think, on this one and take my word for it. It's certainly on a, on a better level than some of the other recent kits I've seen. Um, clarity is very, very good. Very crisp, sharp. Now, it's better than that Rafale, which is a kind of a light for light comparison almost, isn't it? Which was the Al Ravel kit. Much better than that. It's nice, that is. You can make out this central seam on both parts, but it's such a fine one. So what you do, you mask either side of that seam, very close to it. Very gently scrape it, very gently, with a very sharp craft knife blade. And then you just polish it down, and it'll, it'll vanish real quick. And if you use like, like the Tamiya polishes, or others are available, you know. But use some um, modeler's polish. Start, I'd start with a, a medium and go to fine. I won't go to the coarse one. But it's, do you know what? It's that fine on this, this model, it's almost, what a bother. Because I've got to strain almost. You can just catch it in certain lights. It's, it doesn't jump out at you there like it does on some. Some, some kits, like the, the Ravel F15, is like, whoa, really in your face, you know. And even on the, um, what was the Tamiya one I did? Was it the Mustang? I can't remember now. A couple of Tamiya ones, it can be a little bit tricky, you know, if it's a really steep one. But that's, that's a very gentle one. So subtly, you just just make it out. Yeah, you can see it as you turn it. And if I can get that on the camera for you, so you can hear what I'm going on about. So it's better to look rather than pictures are worth a thousand words, aren't they? I think you'll see it if I get it at this angle, and then I start to. Yeah, you can see it now, can't you? Center 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 line runs down it, and it's the same with this. But it is extra extra fine. So I think that's the finest one I think I've ever seen. Finer than Tamiya managed usually. But now those spare parts are really nice. Have you got some distortion there? No, I think that's a reflection. I think we're picking up some reflections in fact that make it all <laughs> look like distortions in the actual part. So there's your front windscreen. They've cleverly moulded this again. Look how they've protected it with these sort of uh, arms to make sure that if you then drop it, I'm not going to actually do it because it's not my property obviously, but you get the idea. If you were to drop that down, crunch, it won't touch the part. I am very, very impressed with this kit. Much more than I expected, you know. And I'm trying to think about what I gave the Zofimora Phantom. Did I give it, did I give it nine and a half? Was it 9.75? I think it's 9.75. just can't remember. I'll have to look back. <laughs> it did well. It was at least nine and a half. I'm fairly confident. But this comes with this one-piece fuselage and it I think it, it's quite clever that because it's going to create even less issues for you in terms of getting it together. So, I'm going to bring it all back. If you'll just indulge me for one second while I try and gently do that where it should be. Like so, we'll get our top back on and then we'll have the final verdict. Now, In terms of reservations, well, it's got great artwork, nice box, it's well packed, 
excellent instructions, I thought they were very good. Better than Academies, a lot better than Academies. Um, not better than Zokimoto though. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to say it, it, it kind of it swings on roundabouts in a way because the, it's got some things that it's got things that are perhaps makes it easier to construct than the Zokimura. Um and perhaps it's a bit less fiddly, I suspect, than it than that was, because that had a lot of parts and you know they're never straightforward. But this is beautifully formed and based on what I see in the box. The only reservations I've got couple of those ejector pins. I think that the canopies look really nice. That's the nicest canopies I've seen this year, maybe. They're certainly right up there with the best canopies I've seen this year. Best clear parts. Beautiful. I'm going to give it 9.75 out of 10. And the only reason it doesn't get a 10 is some of those ejector pins. I think they could have done that slightly better. Tiny, tiny reservation. Not going to affect your quality or your, your finished model, I don't think, at all. That is is quite heartwarming for me because I say I was very put off Meng and I didn't like the way they handled the problem with the triplane. They sort of decided I was a nuisance I think and just decided to ignore me after after and, and, and it wasn't like I was making it up I showed videos of all those every single one they sent me I put on YouTube so people can see what I was complaining about it's quite obvious and they just didn't want to admit it didn't want to keep sending me any more um, now I have heard, actually in their defence, I have heard somebody say that they bought the DR1 triplane recently and it hasn't had those issues at all. So that being the case, I suspect that they have probably gone back to the factory. I'm probably right actually about this. They've probably gone and returned to whoever their extruder was. Maybe one of their regular extrusion factories that they were using originally and got away from the problem that way because it wasn't the mould, it was the way that they were operating them, I'm quite confident about it. And as I've said, I think that they've just gone to some quickly available down the road extruder in, in China. And, uh, and if the people are saying the kits are fine now, then something has changed. So that's great. Anyway, back to this one. It nearly put me off Meng, that bad experience, because it wasn't good. They weren't handling it well, it frustrated me. But this is a return to form for them, for sure, I think. Um, now I've got um, I've got the Jagd Panther which I want to build and that looks like a stunning kit. So this has put me in a really good mood toward them again. I think this has wiped away some of those horrible memories. Perhaps I can just let it go now. Let it go, dude. For God's sake, just let it go. Have a drink and forget all about that awful triplane. Cheers! <laughs> anyway, there we go. So, in fairness, I will now look at Meng afresh with fresh eyes and an open mind and and it does wipe away some bad memories so well done Meng. At that in my eyes actually I think it raises them up a bit quite a lot actually. If they can produce kits to that standard on a consistent basis. Somebody did say to me, uh, it may be David, the owner of the kit, um, that there's, there's some issues about accuracy. Um, I am not an ex-wild weasel pilot, obviously, so I don't know if there's, in terms of rivet counting, I'm not, I'm not trying to be negative. I don't know if there is some technical inaccuracies on the model at all, but the, it, it looks beautiful, really. And if you can pick that up for the sort of money that David did, now, so I won't quote the exact figure, but it was low. If you can pick that up for a song, then I would, don't hesitate, that's a cracking kit, that one. Absolutely stunning kit. In fact, that's probably going to feature in my kits of the year, at the end of the year. That's how good it is. That has got to be one of the top ten kits I've reviewed this year. Easy. Probably even top five. Stay tuned for that at Christmas New Year. <laughs> well, you'll see the lights on, there'll be more drinking, probably have some champagne even. But we mustn't get ahead of ourselves too much, even though we've got my lights flashing in the background. There we go. So, a great success for Meng. Thank you very much to David for lending us the kit and let me open the bags. Really appreciate that. I'll get those resealed for you, don't worry. Um, but that has actually been a revelation to me, and I'm very, very happy and impressed that, that I don't want to be one of these guys that's always, you know, rant at the end of the title. I don't... 
People do that for clickbait, and I don't. If I say rant, I've got a damn good reason to have a rant about something. And it's so nice to have uh, something that's been a rant in the past, if you like, turn into something positive later. And a manufacturer who has stepped up to the plate and made a quantum step forward, and they have. I see them now as, as yes, sneaking in behind Zokimura and Tamiya. They're getting in there, aren't they? They're getting in the mix with the top tier. Unlike the likes of, you know, Border. I mean, Great Wall Hobby are there as well, aren't they? I suppose you could say Great Wall Hobby, Meng, uh, and then maybe Academy, and then you've got the Tamiyas and the Zokimoras in this world. But the others, you know, the Kinetics and the Borders and uh, Trumpeter. Anyway, well, we'll come to that in another story. We'll have another video about that. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it really interesting. I did try and show you this. It took my time today. It's probably been quite a long one, I think. But I wanted you to see it in great detail so you can see it properly. Anybody that fancies a Wild Weasel Phantom, don't hesitate and buy that kit at all. Just make sure you get it at a good price um, because there's a lot of plastic in there and it's great value. So 9.75 out of 10 is where I am at with my review rating. Very close to a 10. Didn't have the injector pin marks. Bit of 10, I think. I think that's fair. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show. hope you give me 10 out of 10 with a thumbs up, a like. Smash that like button. Please smash the like button, okay? And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Ding the notification bell if you are a subscriber and make sure you click the all option, not personalised, because that means YouTube starts deciding what to do and what he thinks you might or might not like. If you enjoyed this content, just smash the all button uh, when you do the notification bell. And that's it for now. As I said, I'll be returning. We've got to talk about these manufacturers as a group. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Tamiya, I'm going to be talking about Zukimura. Uh, I'm going to be talking about ICM, of course. And ICM have got some lovely, interesting things coming along, as ever. Brand new stuff again. They've, they've been the one that's outperformed everybody this year in terms of their uh, number of new kits. They've done a stellar job, to be honest. Especially under strange and difficult conditions that they have to cope with. Um, so thanks to them, you'll see more from me very soon. In the meantime, thanks for joining me, thanks for your time. Take care of yourselves. Till next time. Bye for now.